afternoon, my friends. It is time to start our class. Welcome to those who are here in the sanctuary, those who are joining us online. Welcome. We are studying King David, a man after God's own heart, and we are in lesson number eight, believe it or not. We're just moving quite along. I'm not exactly sure when we'll finish, but we'll finish up here in the next few weeks and start another subject. So today we're going to be in 2 Samuel 9, 2 Samuel chapter 9. And we'll begin reading with verse 1. 2 Samuel chapter 9, begin reading with verse 1. David said, Is there still anyone left from the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness on behalf of Jonathan? Now there was a servant from the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So they summoned him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He replied, I am your servant. The king said, Is there no one else from the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? Ziba responded to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. The king said to him, Where is he? Ziba told the king, He is at the house of Machiar, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. So King David sent for and brought him from the house of Machiar, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul came to David and fell upon his face and bowed down. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he responded, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not be afraid, for I will certainly show you kindness on account of Jonathan, your father. I will return to you every field of Saul, your father, and you will eat at my table perpetually. He bowed low and said, What is your servant that you should be concerned for a dead dog like me? The king summoned Ziba, the servant of Saul, and said to him, All that belongs to Saul and to his house I have given to the son of your master. You will work the ground for him, you, your sons, and your servants. You will bring in the produce so that the son of your master will have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, the son of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Ziba said to the king, Everything that my lord, the king, has commanded his servant, your servant will do. So Mephibosheth ate at the table of David like one of the sons of the king. Now Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all who dwelled in the house of Ziba were servants to Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he ate continually at the table of the king. Now he was lame in both of his feet. Father, I thank you for the reading of your word. Let it go down deep into our hearts. Let us walk away from here today with a wonderful understanding of just how great your grace is. And Father, we have all, those that know you, those that have experienced Jesus Christ, know that we've been grabbed by grace. And we just thank you this day for your wonderful hand, for your glory and your power. And Father, would you minister to the people that are here today? And at the same time, to those who are listening online, let your glory go forth. And shine in every heart. And again, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. So you're driving your car one afternoon when you suddenly jump the curb and you damage the car. And at the same time, you knock down and destroy a city sign. A police officer arrives on the scene and you admit that the accident was your fault. So the police officer, being diligent, writes you a ticket for careless driving. He assigns you a court date and he informs you that the city will be in touch so that you can pay for the damaged sign. This is all normal, by the way. This is exactly how it goes down. This, my friends, is justice. Deserved punishment. So if you're going to take notes, write that down. Justice. Deserved punishment. But then the officer says to you, you know, accidents can happen to anyone. So I'll tell you what I will do. I'll just tear up that ticket. And since you have to pay for the damages to your car... You will not have to pay for the damaged street sign. Now, my friends, if you're taking notes, that's mercy. Somebody say mercy. 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 Exemption from punishment. Justice is punishment deserved. Mercy is exemption from punishment. Well, let's take it one step further. But to take it just a little further, the police officer says, You know, today I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to pay for the ticket. That you should have gotten. Instead of tearing up the ticket, I'm going to pay for it out of my own pocket. 
I'm going to not only pay for the damage to the sign, the city sign, but when you get that car uh, fixed, send me the bill for the car. I'm going to pay for all the damages. My friends, if you're taking notes, that's grace. Favor given when punishment is deserved. Isn't that a beautiful picture of, of how we can see those three things? Justice, mercy, and, and uh, grace. How many times in our lives, how many times in our daily walk uh, have we not understood something in our lives that maybe was ugly or something that was destructive, something that was just bad, and we blame others? I know I'm not the only one guilty of that, so I won't ask anyone to raise a hand, okay? But we see things in our life and we blame others, and maybe we become bitter, and in our bitterness, we isolate. And as we isolate, we draw away from people that really love us. And we find ourselves in a place where we're not in good shape at all. We'll even find ways to make excuses to separate ourselves from God. If it wasn't for the grace of God in our lives, I tell you right now that all of us would be the most miserable creatures on the planet. If it wasn't for the grace of God, we'd be miserable. Because you see, we take ourselves there. We take ourselves by our bitterness and our, and our despondency and our inability to see things in the way that they should be. Or just being forgiving. Or just letting things slide. How many of you need to just take a step back sometimes? And say, you know, let me take a step back. Let, let me just encourage everyone that's here and everyone that's listening to me online. Don't be a victim of your circumstances. You can't have victory if you're a victim. If you're going to have victory over your circumstances, you need to take a step back, see it as God sees it, or see it as it should be. I, I, I will try to tell people all the time, if someone comes to me and says they're really struggling with issues in their life, I might ask them, what, what do you think that's going to look like in six months? Well, in six months, it'll be gone. Bingo. If it'll be gone in six months, why are you pouring all the energy in it now to be so negative? Give things time to resolve. Give Time, give things time to work themselves out. Give God a chance to minister in the midst of whatever the circumstance is that you're going through. Somebody shout amen. So in our text, we are given an amazing picture of how God's grace can grab someone and rescue them from a life of misery. King David lived about a thousand years before Christ. He was successful, he was secure, and he was satisfied with what God had done for him. His name was well known all over the mid Middle East. However, King David was missing his friend Jonathan. Now you know we've talked about Jonathan a few weeks back. Jonathan was the son of King Saul and had been David's closest friend. In fact, we, we saw in our lesson talking about friendship that they were really tight, David and Jonathan. They were the best of friends. And even in the spite of that, that Jonathan's father was trying to kill David, they were still friends, Jonathan and David. According to the culture of the day, Saul's son should have been the next in line to be the king. Saul was king. Jonathan should have been the successor. But God has a way of doing things that goes outside of our plans sometimes. And outside of the norm sometimes. And God had decided that not Jonathan, but who would be king? David. David would be the king. What's so interesting and neat about this particular story is, is that Jonathan accepted that fact and was okay with the fact that David was going to be king and he was not. He was okay with that. It was fine with him because he loved David and he knew it was God's will for his life and for David's life. God will sometimes twist our plans, <laughs> but we need to accept the fact that God is God and I am not. Who agrees? God is God and I am not. Let him work out his plans in my life. So also in the, in the world of that day, it was common that whenever a new family came to the throne of the nation, the first act of state would be to wipe out the other members of the other family. So everybody would be killed. Uh, this was the way that they would keep the throne from being contested. And because of that tradition, Jonathan asked David to be gracious to his family and not to kill any of his heirs. And David fully agreed to that request. Now, to completely understand what is taking place, we need to go back to a battle that happened at Mount Gilboa, where King Saul and his three sons were all killed. This included Jonathan, David's friend. When the word had reached the household of King Saul that Jonathan had been killed, 
There was a panic in the house. Why? Why was there a panic? What did I just say? They were getting ready to be wiped out, you know, so everybody was in a panic, you know. We've got to get out of Dodge. We've got to get out of town. As far as the servants and the guards of the king's residence knew, all right, Mephibosheth, who was the, was the heir or the son of Jonathan, was going to be killed by the new king or by the new king's soldiers or by the new king's family. So they knew that they had to get out of there. And the chaos that followed as they tried to get away, there was an accident. As Mephibosheth's nurse was running with him in her arms, she fell. And when he hit the floor, his spine and legs were damaged, and Mephibosheth became lame and never walked again, or never was able to, to get around again in the way that he was. Years later, while David is on the throne, Mephibosheth is living in a place called Lo Debar, perhaps fearful that someday he might be found and killed. So this part of the story illustrates my first point that I want to make today. And my first point is this, our need of grace. Taking notes, our need of grace. It's really hard to find a better illustration of the need of grace in the Old Testament than Jonathan's son. It's a picture of God's relationship with mankind. Mephibosheth was separated from David and the palace. Lodabar was in northern Palestine. David was down south in Jerusalem. There were many miles of separation between them. My friends, we have to see that picture in our own eyes that without having relationship with God, there is great separation between us and God. Without having a relationship with Jesus, there is great separation from us from God. In Isaiah 59, 2, it says this, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. What a powerful portion of scripture. Uh, a, a scripture that we should all take in our hearts and really underline this and know. Listen, I believe that God hears, but God uh, will not hear the prayers of people that are living in sin, especially sin that is uh, done on purpose or sin that is just justified. I, this is just the way I am. I'll just live my life that way. God is not going to answer those prayers unless it meets something in his plan that goes beyond my ability or your ability to comprehend completely. It, it takes quite a person, I think, to pray to God, asking for God to uh, intervene on his behalf or her behalf and live in sin. Know that they're living in sin. How is it possible to cry out to God and at the same time be rebellious? I, I just don't think that God can operate in that realm. Or he, he can, but I think he chooses not to. It, 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 would be like a, it, it would be like a child who wants all the benefits of being the child, but doesn't want to obey the parent at all. In fact, the child just says, I'm alone. You know? but, I, but I want you to still cook my food, wash my clothes, give me a place to sleep, take me places. But I'll be my own person and do whatever I want to. That just doesn't happen, does it? Okay. Iniquity separates us from God. The number one reason why everyone needs grace is because everyone's sin and evil behavior separates us from God. If you remember in a, in a sermon uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, I talked very clearly about God told the disciples, face last week, God told the disciples to go forth and preach the remittance and repentance of sin. That has not been rescinded. That command has not been rescinded. We are still commanded to go forth and tell the world, repent. Now, I get it that there's a lot of people in places that don't want to hear that message, you know. Or a lot of people say, what's wrong with, with the way I'm living? What's wrong with my lifestyle? Why can't I live this way? Because the scriptures say that it's sinfulness. Yeah, but I... We live in the 21st century. All that stuff is outdated and no longer in effect. No, God's word is still powerful for us today and still applies to us today. It's still sinfulness, okay? It's still evil behavior. But guess what? There's an answer for that. It's, God didn't just leave you to your sin. God just didn't leave you to evilness. God said, I'm going to give you a, a, a plan of redemption. I'm going to provide for you the rescue. Somebody shout amen. Amen. And he did. He provided the rescue through Christ Jesus our Lord. God said, receive my son into your heart. Follow after him. Walk after him. 
believe in Him, take Him as Lord and Savior of your life, and you no longer have to live in sin. Sin no longer needs to have dominion over your lives. You can walk in holiness, and heaven will be your home. That should be a glory, opportunity, and moment to give God praise. He's provided for us the rescue, the, the delivery. I've been delivered from that. And yet we still, want to, we still want to wallow in our sin. It's almost unbelievable. I've been set free. Anybody else? I've been set free by the wonderful power and hand of God. I no longer have to give in to sin. Mephibosheth was afraid of David's power. The first thing David said to him when he arrived at the palace was, Do not fear. David had to set Mephibosheth at ease. Do not fear. David could sense that he was fearful. There was no need for him to be afraid, but he didn't know that because he didn't know David. That's the way it is with us, I think, mankind. Any person that is separated from God and ignorant of him may be fearful of him. I, I listened to a young woman one time who was not saved, did not know Jesus. And when she was trying to explain God to her, God was this person that was up in heaven hiding behind the clouds with a giant hammer in his hand. And every time she made a mistake, he would reach out from behind the cloud and bonk her on the head with it. That was her ideal of who God was. This vengeance or wicked or, or a mean God that would just punish everybody at the drop of a hat. I, I don't see that anywhere in Scripture. What I see is a loving God who wants to redeem His people and bring them back into the, into the covenant with Him, right, in a loving relationship with Him. He has is, he is promised to walk with us and to keep us and hold us and be with us. It's the rebellious children that need help. It's the rebellious children that need the encouragement to get right before God. God is not mean. God is just. And when you walk in sinfulness, then there's punishment that comes along with that. Any parent that is going to do things correctly will always lead their children in a way where they are going to be disciplined, discipled. If a child misbehaves, then there's something that happens there. My, my father used to say, John, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. And I'd say, well, don't do it then. Did, did, he let, did he let me get away with that? No. He loved me anyway. Come on. He loved me anyway. My father loved me enough to make sure that I understood that my behaviors were not correct and they needed to change. Did he always do it right? Probably not. But his heart was in the right place and he tried to do the best he could with what he knew and what he had. God, though, is perfect, isn't he? God knows exactly what we need, when we need it, and he will give it to us. And sometimes we don't like that, do we? But did you know that God disciplines those he loves? God corrects those who he loves. Do you know if you don't correct a, a, a belligerent child, if you don't put a child on the right course, that's neglect. That's not love. Love is to help a person know and see their way and the way to go. It's the reason why that we have pastors and churches and people that congregate so that there can be that loving correction. It, it was Paul that told Timothy the scripture has been given for reproof, correction, teaching, doctrine. All those things have been given so that we could be the people that would be complete in him. Let us be that complete person. So, yeah, there are people that are ignorant of him and they're fearful of him. Many have the idea that God hates them and wants them to burn in hell forever. That's not the truth. That's just not the truth. When people don't know God, they often are so afraid of him that they hide from him. They don't realize that God actually loves them and cares about them. Just as Mephibosheth learned that he didn't have to fear David, so too we can learn that we do not need to fear God but trust in his marvelous grace, love, and forgiveness. Let me just say that one more time. We do not have to fear God but trust in his marvelous grace, love, and forgiveness. It would be understandable if Mephibosheth was hostile towards David. Uh, when the soldiers went to get him, he was probably thinking, again, I'm just kind of looking into it a little bit, but he was probably thinking, what does he want with me? What does he want with me? Why doesn't he just leave me alone? I didn't ask to be born into this miserable family. Can you see that coming from somebody? I didn't ask to be born in this miserable family. I didn't deserve to be lame and all because of King David. What a... What a mean, mean person he is. Hostility is not an uncommon response among those who don't know or understand God. 
Sometimes people may ask the question, why, did the, why in the world are these Christians pushing their morals on me anyway? Why don't they just leave me alone? I was telling, I can't remember who it was, I was telling somebody the story of, of uh, Billy Graham many years ago. He was invited to come play a round of golf with some PGA professionals. And he went out on the course and they played all 18 holes and came back. And one of the first guys back threw his clubs on the ground and, and, and stomped off and said, I'm not going to have no religion shoved down my throat. And he walked and got off the course. And the others came off of the course and someone asked one of the other players, Man, this guy was pretty hot. What did Billy Graham say? He goes, say? He didn't say anything. He just played golf. What was it that was convicting this fellow? The power of the Holy Spirit was convicting this fellow. You know, our, if we're living our lives for Jesus, how many know that speaks volumes? It preaches. Your life preaches. Your life tells a story. How, how you do things tells a story. Oh, why don't these Christians stop pushing their morals on me? Why don't they just leave me alone? Perhaps hostility is a response to something someone cannot understand. Non-Christians cannot live like Christians until they meet Jesus and are changed by him. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was undone, but God put me back together again. When I was lost, I did not understand spiritual matters because they were beyond me. But when I got saved, the Holy Spirit came and dwelled inside of me. And now I begin to understand spiritual matters. My eyes once were closed. Now they're open. Who understands what I'm saying? We need a salvation. And a salvation takes place. My mind will begin to be open to the things of God, to the things of the Spirit. Until then, people are lost. And they just truly do not understand. It takes transformation. Anybody here glad you've been transformed by the power of God? I believe God desires that people be saved. I believe He wants people growing spiritually. I believe He wants people to walk in maturity. That is God's grace in action. Mephibosheth was in a miserable place. And actually the place where he was hiding it was called Lodabar. And it literally means no pasture or place of desolation or barrenness. That was really what he had in his own spirit. What a perfect description of a man's condition when they are far from God, barren and desolate. For some, it takes a while to understand that, but ultimately, that is where life away from God leads. The bottom line, then, is that mankind away from God, afraid of and hostile toward Him, in a miserable place, need to hear the good news that Jesus saves, and that the God is the only way that man can come to that. God loves sinners. Somebody shout amen. God loves sinners, even sinners like me, okay, and you, and wants to help everyone with his amazing grace. So that's the first point, you know, the, the, this ideal of grace. So what is the meaning of grace? My second point, the meaning of grace. King David searched for someone who needed kindness and grace. Most of us, before we knew about the love of God, acted as if we didn't care. Uh, I used to tell the people at the... Uh, at uh, Maple Lane School, when I worked there, that if a boy was having a bad day, and he was in his room, and he was having a bad day, and he was tearing things up, I would try to go over and calm him down, you know, and I'd go to the window and look in the window, and there he'd be in there just being really upset, and I'd say, hey, uh, why are you doing all this? Don't you know it's just going to cause you trouble? I don't care. <laughs> Guess what? They cared. He was just upset, <laughs> you know. But the first thing out of his mouth was, I don't care, you know. Listen, we have to understand uh, that we need uh, this uh, redemption that comes about. People may say that they don't care, but they do. Even though our actions cry out that we're not looking for God, aren't you grateful that God is constantly reaching out to grab people with His grace? Although you say, I'm not looking for God. Uh, Brian and I were talking before the service about an individual that we're praying for that needs God. And we're desperately praying that God would save this person, all right? How many of you believe we can pray for the salvation of people? And at the same time, know that, and how do, I, how do I keep my spirits lifted in that? When I see this person living in despair, how do I keep my spirits up? Because I know that God saved me. And if God can save me, He can save this person. Somebody shout amen. So I want to be excited about what God can do. God can reach people, grabbing people with His grace. Back before I was a Christian, or you were a Christian, you probably knew you needed something, but you didn't have the foggiest notion what it was. 
Perhaps you looked for satisfaction and fulfillment in all kinds of things. I know I did a lot of that. But couldn't find it because the things of the world are empty. They may bring temporary pleasure. They may bring temporary relief of some kind, but they just go away. Then one day, God reached into our heart, grabbed us by grace, and our life began to change. This young crippled provided no practical value to David. He had done nothing to even attract David's attention, much less anything to merit such generous treatment. It would be more understandable had David been rewarding a war hero or a model citizen for his effort. In one sense, Mephibosheth was a nobody. He even acknowledged that about himself. To him, it was incredible that David was being so kind. Mephibosheth knew, I don't deserve what David wanted to do. David lavished abundance upon him that he had not earned. Listen to that. <coughs> lavished abundance upon him that he did not deserve. I serve a God like that that wants to give abundantly, lavishly to me. And guess what? I haven't earned one bit of it. Not one. God is a God of grace. He wants to lavish upon me His abundance and on those who have done absolutely nothing to deserve it. And Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one should boast. A gift isn't something you've earned or deserved. It's something that is given as a result of kindness on the part of the giver. We must not think that God forgave us because we were so great or wonderful. <laughs> we are neither. He gives us grace out of the goodness of his heart. David offered this kindness of grace on the basis of the merits of someone else. This is just so important. So important. Remember David's words back in verse 1. Is there yet anyone left that I may show him kindness for whose sake? Jonathan's sake. David did these things on the basis of what Jonathan had done for him. Listen, this is very important. Mephibosheth was receiving blessing, not that he had earned, but by what his father had done. You see, it was really Jonathan's actions, Jonathan's place that earned Mephibosheth the blessings that he was receiving. Why is that important, Pastor John? Because it's the same principle that we have in our lives. In the same way that Jonathan provided for Mephibosheth, God does the same thing to us on the basis of what Jesus Christ did for you and I on the cross of Calvary. I haven't earned my position with God, neither of you. It doesn't matter how long or how passionate or how well I've done. It doesn't matter how many years I've served the Lord. I stand where I do today because of Jesus Christ and He alone. He is the reason for my redemption. And just like the son stood where he was because of his father, Jonathan, so we shouldn't boast on ourselves either. But who believes instead of boasting about me, we should boast about God? Let's give God the glory. Let's give God all the credit because it's through Him that we know that we are anyone. We are worth more to God than anything else because of his great love that he pours out upon us. We eat. I love this vision of this. We eat with our feet under God's table just like all Christians and enjoy the benefits of family membership because Christ suffered for us on our behalf. David helped a man who could not help himself. Where, where was Mephibosheth every time that the meal was given? Where was he at? At the table of David. Where was his feet? Under the table. There's a beautiful picture of the protection and the glory and the covering of, of David as the king of Israel. When I sit at the Lord's table, my feet rest underneath that. and There's a great covering there. Although I was crippled by sin and, and deformed by evil, God has set me free from those things and provided for me a wonderful covering that I couldn't provide for myself. Listen, Mephibosheth couldn't fight for himself. He couldn't work. He was dependent upon the goodness of others. Likewise, grace is God's helping those who cannot help themselves. We've all been crippled and deformed by sin. We cannot get up and walk with God without God as our own power. We are incapable of being right spiritually in our own strength. Anybody here need God? 
I know I do. Romans 5, 6 says, While we were yet weak, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Even after getting right with God, we are still dependent upon His help and the handouts of ever-increasing grace. God just keeps on extending to us His great grace. Uh, I heard my, my mentor, Mark Rutland, one time preach a sermon, and he said, People argue all the time on how many graces there are. He says, let me just tell you, how many breaths did you take today? How many breaths did you take? That's grace. Don't talk to me about how many graces there are. He said, every time you take a deep breath, give God glory of his wonderful grace, his wonderful power. My third point is the power of grace. The power of grace. So what did you suppose it was like for Mephibosheth to live in the palace of David as though he were a son? There he was, right along with Ammon, Absalom, and later Solomon, and the other sons of David. We see these mighty men in Scripture. We see their names all the time. We hear about them all the time. But Mephibosheth was right there with them, sitting at the same table they were sitting at. It must have been pretty incredible. He could share in all the benefits of royalty. Do you, ever, do you suppose that he ever forgot how he got there? <laughs> do you suppose he ever lost sense of the gratitude for what, God, for what David had done for him? I don't think so. In fact, I don't think he could. Why? Because being in David's household and eating at David's table, as nice as it was, didn't take away the fact that he was still lame in both feet. He could see his inadequacy, his lame lack of his lack of having. In the same way, even when we are adopted into God's family and eat at his table, our humanity still lingers over and over again. We are reminded of how weak we are, how insufficient in ourselves we are, how sinful we can be if we don't rely upon the Lord. I, I know no one else struggles with those things, but Without God's great grace, sin can really have dominion in our lives. Even though we may still struggle with our sin nature at times, we are called to overcome it and be obedient to God. If you want to overcome your flesh, be obedient to God. If you, if you want to overcome fleshly desires, walk in the Spirit. Listen to the power of God as He speaks into your life. Listen, the struggle with the flesh will always be with us. Uh, some of you remember Elsie Smith that used to be here. And Elsie used to, used to tell me, she would say, you know, Pastor, every one of us have a dog inside of us, you know. And that dog will eat whatever you feed it. All right? So stop feeding it all that sin, you know. <laughs> Start feeding it grace. So she understood there's this battle that goes on within all of us. So every one of us have a fight that goes on within us. It's the flesh versus the spirit. If we will feed the spirit, the flesh will die. If we feed the flesh, then the spirit will diminish. Who believes we should be feeding the spirit in ourselves and keep it strong before God? So, okay, so we eat at the Lord's table in spite of our condition, not because we have overcome in our strength, but because of what God has done for us. I don't deserve it, but God gives it to me anyway. Now, though Mephibosheth was still lame in both feet, each time he put his feet under David's table, his true condition was covered up. Think about that. Because of God's grace, the same is true of us. The blood of Jesus Christ covers our sin, our sin nature, our weaknesses, our humanity, our failings, and our shortcomings. I am so thankful that the blood of Jesus has washed away my sins. And not just covered them up, but washed them completely away. They are no longer there. Uh, I'm a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. Anyone else? Amen. All my old stuff is gone. I got to start over. <laughs> I got to redo. Okay. Now what God is saying, walk in the power of my spirit, be the person I've called you to be, and I will keep you at the same time. The blood of Jesus covers our sins, our sin nature, our weaknesses, our humanity, our failings, and our shortcomings. His grace redeems us and gives us hope. Hallelujah. Is there anything better than that? No, a thousand times, no. The grace of God is sufficient. What did Paul say? Your grace is sufficient for me. 
came across this story I thought it was pretty interesting on April 30th 2002 in a youth ministry class at Hannibal LaGrange College everyone was doing last minute studying for their final exams in youth issues class now this if you've ever gone to college you know that you get exams and as you get exams you have to take the test and if you're like anybody on the planet that's alive you cram to the very last minute trying to get in as much information as you can and usually what will happen is the teacher will come in. In this case, the teacher came in and said that they would do a review for a few minutes before the test. That's fairly normal as well. He went through the review, and most of it was right out of the study guide, and all the guys in the class were great. But then suddenly he started saying things that no one had ever heard before. He started talking about things. Wait a minute. Wait, professor, wait a minute. We did not talk about that in class. You're surely not going to put it on the test. And what do you think he said? It's in the book. It's in the book that you were issued at the beginning of the class. You were given instructions to do what with the book? Read it. And he says, you are responsible for everything that is in the book along with everything that was discussed in class. Many of them broke out in a sweat on the spot. Because now suddenly they're responsible for things that they were pretty sure they weren't going to be able to remember. So the students couldn't really argue with the professor because it was right in the syllabus that they were responsible for everything that was in the book. Finally, it was time to take the test. And the, and the professor said, leave all the tests face down until everyone has one and I will tell you when to start. So when everybody got their test, the professor said, okay, you can turn them over now. When the students turned them over, every sheet, every test had all the answers already filled in. The bottom of the page had the following note. This is the end of the final exam. All the answers on your test are correct. You will receive an A on the final exam. The reason you passed the test is because the creator of the test took it for you. All the work you did in preparation for this test did not help you to get an A. You have just experienced grace. He then went around the room and asked each student individually, what is your grade? Do you deserve the grade you received? How much did all your studying for this exam help you achieve your final grade? Listen, guys. We can work. We can struggle, we can try, we can put a lot of effort in trying to be righteous and holy or in being right standing with God. But at the end of the day, what I need is grace from God because I need for Him to grab hold of me and give me that that I need to make it through the day. I need Jesus. Perhaps most of us need to understand the miracle of God's grace better than we do. In what area of our lives do we need the Holy Spirit to apply more of God's grace? I'm reminded of the, the quote in James where the, the pastor, I call him Pastor James, pastor cried out, more grace. <laughs> there would be some that would argue that grace alone is sufficient because God gives us all the grace we need. But Pastor James said, I need more grace. I live in a world and in a situation and time where I need more grace. He must have been married. He must have had children. He was pastor of a church. So what did Pastor James need? Not only grace, but more grace. More grace, Lord. Give me more grace to be able to meet the needs of the day. Help me, Holy Spirit, to apply the grace that God gives. Because I need it at home. I need it in my marriage. I need it in my ministry. I need it in my career. I need it in my private life. I need it all around. When I'm lonely, when I'm desperate, when I'm in need, when I'm struggling, when I'm hurting, when I'm in despair, I need grace. And when I'm in great pain, do you remember the words of the Apostle Paul? When I'm in great pain and call out to God and ask for help, let me remember what God said to Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. Father, I love you so much. I thank you for this day. What a blessing it's been together with these, my friends. And study about this wonderful principle and concept of grace. 
how we all need it, how we, how we have not earned it, but oh, how we need it, and how we need the power of your glory to go before us to be the men and women of God that you've called us to be. So, Father, continue to pour out your grace more and more every day so that we can walk in your glory and your power. So go before us this day, I pray, and we give you all thanks and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So glad to have everyone here. Thank you for joining us online. Until we see you again, God bless. Go in peace. Thank you.